Hi. Hi, Big Bird. Hi. Right. Part two of this uh, video is going to talk about why Games Workshop products are so expensive. And we're going to talk about what Games Workshop is, particularly as a company, and uh, especially as a public liability company, PLC. Or, um, so you have a private limited company or a public limited company or public liability company. And we're going to talk about how that affects uh, Games Workshop's bottom line. Uh, what and bring into perspective kind of the, how that structure incentivizes the way it works as a company so uh, learning about corporate structures aren't necessarily important for the purpose of this only relevant to what we're going to talk about but there are two types of main entities uh, that exist corporately or for any um, company that's not a in a sole uh independent business so a sole individual who uh has a business and that is a um private limited company um so a limited liability company and then also a public company or a public liability company now back in ye olden days um if you had a business and it incurred some sort of a loss so whereby um you would go under that you would basically become insolvent entirely with your finances what that means is um if your business fell apart you were screwed more or less um then this lovely thing called limited liability came into play so what that basically means is if you're a director of a company and you own a company and the company becomes insolvent and um it is being struck off so it becomes dissolved involuntarily what that means is the company will seize any assets that belong in the company to pay back whatever shareholders own a share of the profitability in that company and um but the director themselves or the owners of the company would not be personally liable for whatever is going on now that's very good because it means that you have a sort of collateral um, on the company but if if it really goes badly um, you don't lose everything as a result of the company failing so in short you your failed experiment of opening a business isn't going to affect yourself entirely as a whole which is good because it means you can afford to take risks and uh, my understanding is that opening a company is actually relatively inexpensive in the uk anyway so um the the benefit of being a limited liability company is um though you do incur all the risks you get full leverage and range on how you want to do that so if you're writing a constitution for the company which is known as an articles of association in british law um, you can essentially tailor that to suit however you want it to suit you so you can choose the number of directors you can choose uh, what the shares are going to be um, what rights come with the shares and the holdings in those companies um, you can say uh, every year the the director gets a thousand brown m&ms and it's legally binding you can do whatever terms you want within reason um, otherwise it goes to a model articles um, and that's based on english common law which is a bit more vague and open to interpretation which is why it's not really recommended then you have a public liability company or a plc um, so a public liability company basically means that the company's uh, progress or status is on the public market so in the us this is nasdaq so it's it's on the stocks or and it's publicly available for people to see um everything is more or less within the company very much public knowledge and because of that um people can buy and sell the shares publicly within the company so games workshop is a public liability company you can buy shares uh, in games workshop if you so wish uh, stocks and shares etc and um it basically means that um, you have somewhat of a say if it is based on a shareholder's um, 
the liability of the company that you can um, make money doing that because you are promised a return on the amount of money that you're making. Now, this can be very good uh, because in a, in a sort of way, and it can also be a detriment. Every sort of corporate structure has its um, pe- uh, costs and also benefits at the same time. So the benefits are... Um, the the company it has to be held liable more to the public and also its shareholders as a result which means that it needs to have to consistently prove itself as a result which means that it uh, needs to guarantee to both uh, parties in question dividends so that is it needs to guarantee that it is giving the public uh, the best quality service for its money for the best product even though that might not in practice be necessarily the case and it needs to give a, a guarantee to its shareholders that it is giving dividends now this isn't something that is merely done on the process of how much money the company is making you can't simply just make good money and then everything's all well and good there's a liability process that goes along with that and that usually takes the form of an annual report or annual um agm or annual general um, holders meetings or annual general meetings for board of directors or if it's a um, public liability company that'll be for its shareholders and uh, dividends from my understanding um So you have to explain in a very detailed document not only the kind of uh, profits that are being made and the dividends that is being given, but you have to financially justify to uh, the people who have shares in your company um, why you are in the current state you are. And what's actually quite interesting is corporations tend to play very complicated word games so this usually happens in two situations one is annual reports and annual accounts essentially and what you actually find is and you need to be a very skilled accountant to see this is the way that certain uh, profits and certain assets and gains are done by corporations tend to be worded in a specific way that makes it as though it is to the advantage of the person seeing it that everything is rose tinted specs so everything is going very well when it might not actually be the case but it's worded in a specific way it's very complicated i have a difficulty trying to articulate it based on how complicated it is um which which is why we're actually going to go into kind of the costs rather than the benefits so the cost to this is you are ultimately held more accountable your regulations placed on you as an entity is more stringent um, corporations contrary to popular belief are actually some of the most regulated entities in the business world uh, certainly and that goes for entities operating multinationally like shell bp etc um, contrary to popular belief as mentioned uh, it means you're often held accountable it often means that your shareholders who are often very timid and frugal because they want to see the most return without uh, with a lack of risk will often um, be very scared at the first thought of something going wrong, which is why a lot of uh, PLCs tend to play the uh, stable game and diversify their portfolio and try to stick as stably as possible. Uh, No news is good news, and if there is going to be bad news, word it in such a way that it seems like a good thing. Um, So... Um, And because of that liability, it often makes it incredibly difficult um, to make any innovative decisions because everything is so corporate structured. Um, If you have a a private limited company or a limited liability company, the, the ultimate benefit is that you have ultimate sway on how that company is run, especially if you are a director and a sole shareholder. Um... Uh, because you can have shares in the company that are not owned by the director but the the benefit of doing that is you have ultimate decision making on how the corporation or company is run especially if you are what's called a person with significant control where you have a certain percentage of shares voting rights the right to appoint um, directors or remove them or you might not have any of that and have significant influence and control, which means that in a sort of informal way, you have a 
um, significant say on how the company is run. So you might not be a director, but you might be invited to be a part of the board of directors in general meetings. You are a person with significant control. Um, now, things are a lot more transparent than what they used to be because this never really used to be a requirement. And it's actually going to be more stringent in the next couple of years because the British government in particular wants to make it very clear that they can see who is in control in terms of ownership when it comes to businesses um, and also public ones as well. And if you're, say, a company in Delaware, um, which is a very corporate friendly, you don't really want to give that information away. American companies tend to be very tight when it comes to trying to show ownership of who owns what. So there's potential conflict there. Now, this ultimately uh, brings me on to my next point, which is Games Workshop. Now, um, public liability companies are ultimately um, held responsible and liable to two key parties. Their shareholders, who they have to justify the dividends that they're making, and then uh, the public as well. Now, contrary to popular belief, corporations are prob probably one of the most public entities that exist despite being private especially public liability companies because they are liable to these two um, parties essentially the public their customers and also uh, their shareholders who have dividends um, and just to make a comparison point um, you, you can actually note this in conjunction with the public sector uh, the public or uh, institutions that are owned by the state um, are only liable to the public but they have a monopoly on everything that they do so as a result of that they're actually only liable to themselves which is why you kind of get this stereotype of things being more state run being more inefficient because ultimately the best thing about not being profit driven means that you have no way to measure your effectiveness as an organization which means that um, you can screw up as many times as you want and because you own a monopoly on something um, you can be as inefficient as you want I'm just giving you context for the sake of giving context about that um, but because of that and I'll, I'll bring up my notes uh, this has several key reasons for the way that GW advertises itself and kind of pushes its profit margins onwards um, now, the thing you need to understand about this sort of stuff is that the relationship between the public, so uh, GW's customers and their shareholders, is actually symbiotic. So uh, one has an effect on the other. If there are um, issues with the uh, public, i.e. they're not buying enough products or that there's not enough sales, GW then has to justify those sales to... Uh, their shareholders or justify that state of affairs to their shareholders and they can only word it as positively or create a positive spin as much as they can when talking about that and now um if it affects pardon me uh if if there is a issue whereby um people are pulling out with um the shareholders um, it has a detrimental effect on the public as well because uh, these things are common knowledge they're made as transparent as possible and as a result of that it, it um, loses public faith people stop buying their products um, it can often have a snowball effect uh, whereby it has a direct effect on business and branches start to close um, and you see this with supermarkets that don't make enough money Woolworths is a good example but Phones for You, which I worked for as well, uh, is one of those things when uh, things just go under and the company gets struck off. Um, so, you know, the it, it's the these institutions are held or these companies are held accountable, and the pattern that you see is actually that, especially with public liability companies, there's a lot of accountability. Um, and actually, it's a very delicate line that these companies have to cross. Now, when talking about this, we need to talk about why Games Workshop can justify um, the amount of growth that they've had and the amount of profits that have been made. 
And um, based on this fact that kind of public liability companies and also partly private ones go through um, with reference to trying to benefit both the customer and its shareholder, a lot of people would turn and ask, um, surely the high prices that GW does is not sustainable in the future. Now, this is kind of the main points because GW in the context of miniature wargaming for the past 20 years and also other companies is actually quite expensive uh kings of war you can get an army for about you know three quarters to half the price that you could but then again as mentioned in my previous video flames of war does like uh three tiger tanks for like 25 to 30 pounds i think so and those are like 15 millimeters so the amount of plus that you're getting per pound isn't as big so it can actually vary quite a bit and i think other companies who make miniatures are catching on and actually pricing accordingly as as from what i've seen anyway is an indication but i i would say that um the fact that gw's profits and the growth of their shares and their stocks and also the uh kind of growth of the prices shows that um, contrary to what people might think the growth is actually sustainable um, so in other words GW can simply just uh, mark up the price um, and fine tune it however they want to do it because in the long run people are going to buy their products regardless this is indicated by what uh, the prices are being raised to and what people are willing to buy um, now in the context of gw uh the the products are relatively cheap the plastic is extremely cheap to manufacture um and because of that um gw whatever gw makes is going to be profitable so they're actually getting quite a substantial dividends i.e money back as a surplus and profit on um what they're actually selling this stuff could be sold at half price and they would still make a very hefty profit um they'll probably not do it uh drastically with price rises but they'll do it gradually um because it would garner too much negative press and the last thing they want is instability especially in the context of advertising but also uh, advertising to their shareholders um and because of this like i said they can fine tune the price to whatever they want um and the, the reason that you can particularly do this is if you've seen my first video um they actually have a unique position in the market when it comes to wargaming and that's essentially because they've merged their ip successfully with um their what the their activity that they encourage and that they sell which is essentially wargaming and miniature collection more people collect the products of gw rather than actually play the game um the whole process that gw invests in is you buying the products um uh, getting them home uh, clipping the sprues off assembling the models uh painting them basing them paint um they get painting again but um yeah doing all this uh, preferably as they would hope with gw products um so the paints uh the tool and hobbying set despite how uh, expensive they are and um they're sending a whole experience for you that isn't really done elsewhere there are a few brick and mortar stores from competitors but otherwise it doesn't really exist i as i've said in my previous video the equivalent would be disney opening uh, a range of stores called star wars and selling miniature war games completely star wars based in there which has its own products that are unique no other company seems to do this um which is why they have a unique place in the market and which is why in a way they because of that they can kind of fine tune the products to um however much they want to charge them for so this is the first way you can in interpret this the second way you can interpret this which is more of a ruthless way but i think uh economics kind of derives itself without the opinions of people and will happen regardless so the the effects of the economic state of affairs doesn't change because you wish it to be in a in a way in a specific way um and and this relates to gw because uh, the the basis is and i know there's this discussion about uh gw being a luxury product and people say actually it's not but the the mentality of games workshop is is that 
if you cannot afford to buy Games Workshop's products, you are not their target audience. Uh, the, the simple reason is you're not buying their products, either because you can't afford to or because you don't want to. Um, so the demographic of GW today are often middle class or upper middle class people who can afford to do the hobby uh, regularly or have well off parents who can afford to buy them GW products regularly. So this is actually an explanation I've done in uh, relation to somebody who commented on my previous video, but I think it actually works well here and I'm kind of paraphrasing or speaking directly uh from this and i think they're valid points but we'll go on now um to a lot of people this might seem unfair um but remember like i've said economics works its own way whether or not you think it's fair or not um and this goes with government policies for example affordable housing so for example statistically speaking places which have had a more affordable housing um tend to actually have higher levels of homelessness um, and this includes places with rent control which is um, particularly set and the simple reason is that in places where the price is artificially lower there's more space so less space is becoming economized so for example if you're an elderly couple um, you're going that space you would have given up to move somewhere smaller is not going to be used up or is not going to be given up because it's so cheap, artificially speaking. Um, it also means that landlords aren't going to be obligated to keep their place as neat and tidy as they originally were because they're actually not getting um, their money's worth for how much they think it is based on the market price. Um, and also um, people just have a lot of room that they otherwise would have economized more so that means the less houses to go around or flats to rent and often people who really need those flats tend to um, not be able to afford them and tend to become homeless or in situations where it's desperate aren't going to be able to find available accommodation and you see that in places like san francisco and new york which are places from my understanding which are revered for being places which have highly regulated affordable housing and or at least rent control anyway and the point is just because something is idealistically wanted or desired doesn't necessarily mean that it's um shifting economics to suit that is necessarily a good thing um, so if I put a policy in place as a hypothetical example called the I don't want to kill like don't kill puppies policy you might think well yeah of course like you wouldn't want to see puppies die would you so you would be behind that um, policy but as if as a result of that policy a hundred thousand people die every day well you don't know any better because as far as you're aware there's a policy called don't cute kill cute puppies policy so you're not going to be um, very mindful of what the after results of uh, that policy is, even if it results in 100,000 people dying. They're just because a policy is noted and called a certain thing doesn't necessarily mean that there's no repercussions to that policy, whether private or public. Um, so uh, we'll use another example. If there's 98% um, clearness in water, impurity, um if if um bringing it to 99 percent results in half the gdp of the united states being spent you're going to think that's in vain uh, in the same way that if it takes the 50 percent of the united states gdp um to keep a person alive who's on life support for an extra 50 uh seconds in economically speaking it doesn't seem like it's worth doing because it, it doesn't really seem like the cost to benefit analysis is any better than what it would have been previously because keeping somebody alive in a hospital for 50 more seconds when it's very clear that they're not going to be alive regardless of that amount of time uh, puts into perspective kind of what the benefit versus the cost is and the same goes for um, this sort of thing just because 
a a certain uh, thing doesn't seem fair doesn't mean that it doesn't exist as a state of affairs. And I've had this problem myself with the hos- with the hobby. Um, uh, there are certain things I want to do in the hobby, and it's going to cost me a lot of money because things are quite expensive. And for example, doing a lot of conversion work, um, a lot of bits that I could have otherwise buy online um, that I I can't get um, really otherwise um, isn't so much the case of new kits. So it makes converting for me even more difficult and that means I have to spend a lot more money to do that. Um, that's just the fact of life now. I can't go around um, paying the sort of low amount of money I used to in order to do that. The only um, alternative is if I buy third-party products. Um, and that for me crosses somewhat of an ethical line. Um, so for example if it's a fairly big thing and it looks like GW and it's not from GW um, and it's done very much in the likeness it's sort of crossing an ethical line with uh, GW's IP so um, you know some people don't have qualms with that but for myself I do Um, now because it costs a lot for myself that doesn't exclude the fact that it won't cost other people the same in other words, there's people who can better af- afford it who it won't affect. So in my case, and I'm using myself as an example, um, my situation isn't relevant if Games Workshop is still going to be making money, regardless of the fact that I'm outpriced in the hobby. So if I can't afford it, despite the fact that I go to a third-party re- uh, retailer and buy it with a f- 15% or 10% discount um, it doesn't matter ultimately and that's because at the end of the day the businesses reflect uh, the practices of who they sell to and who they're willing to buy pro- their products f- or, or, or who's willing to buy their products uh, a company is very much a mirror it reflects uh, whoever is looking into that mirror um, and it reflects uh the interest of that company in relation to the people who are looking in that mirror as well. Um, So it ultimately reflects the company, but the company has a purpose to do a certain thing and it makes the most money from the people who are willing to buy the products who it gives its um, service to, which is the people which is the people who the company is willing to sell to. Um, If that so happens to exclude a small amount of people or a large amount of people actually but the company is still making a profit it doesn't necessarily matter because it can only reflect what the company is ultimately um, seeing as working more because it's profit and it's um, shareholder dividends is ultimately a feedback loop that's the most reliable thing it it implies the survivability so their ability to survive within the next month or annually and uh, if not there's a possibility that it can go under and corporations contrary to what people believe unless you are very big um and like monolithic don't last very long um the the corporations within the FTSE 100 don't tend to last uh, very long. Um, the top high end corporations that tend to last like within a 15 year period are very few and far between. Um, so how does this change? So if we want to um, change the state of affairs, how does this happen? Um, so. Uh, the price will very much be fine-tuned by Games Workshop until two factors come into play. Uh, firstly, people stop buying their products due to prices being so high. And this also includes the middle and upper middle class people. So, for example, the people who can afford to pay um, for their children's uh, wargaming hobby monthly and will buy them a battle force every month or like a tank or a squad of soldiers... Uh, guardsmen space marines whatever um the the moment that they aren't buying the products we now have a problem or gw will say we now have a problem because the prices are 
even for uh, people who it doesn't really affect relevant to the finances they earn um, looking at that and saying that I don't think we can justify this even though the dad's a lawyer and the mum's a doctor or the mum's a teacher and the dad's like uh, a high end corporate earner or something like that um if they're turning around and they're earning like 150k a year or whatever and they're saying like the price is too expensive um the price will begin to stagnate naturally simply because there just aren't enough uh, purchases being made and uh, games workshop would need to give one way or another and the main reason they would have to give way is to one incentivize more people to buy their products um, but also to justify to their shareholders why they're not making any turnover or profit and um, or at least why it's not obtained as much growth as before remember shareholders are very timid creatures and they're often um, very uh, frugal and also uh, very sensitive to the market um, and that can cause a ripple effect especially with companies you have to walk a very fine line to make sure that you're not showing any instability uh, in which case uh, it can have a stampede effect and it can ultimately cause the corporation to kind of go under because it creates a cyclical effect whereby shareholders are going out clo shops start to close products are not going to be sold as much like i said there's a symbiotic of a relationship between the public and the shareholders at the same time um so yes that's one particular way in which um, the price no longer is fine-tuned and the the point where games workshop no longer has a unique place in the market so the second point is that uh there's adequate competition from other wargaming uh, manufacturers or stores um, who, ha who produce their own wargaming or miniature collecting which will cause a games workshop to price their products competitively now from my understanding we've seen this already with their paints which have say stayed somewhat competitive in price because um, in line with their other products they actually haven't increased that much in price um, however I actually don't think this is very viable um, and I don't think it will occur as much with miniature war games um, because again Games Workshop has a, new, a unique place in the market where they've effectively merged their IP with uh, their miniature war gaming hobby um, no other competitor as far as I'm aware can offer this um, nobody else has been able to do the same so though GW doesn't really have a monopoly on the market because there are other competitors who sell war games or miniature collecting uh, they have this part of the market cornered based on what GW offers as a product to their customer now people will often ask about um, outsourcing to alternative uh, cheaper ways in which to um, get miniature wargaming products in relation to Games Workshop that is not game work, Games Workshop and uh, the, the answer to that um, usually comes in the form of 3D printers now 3D printers are quite interesting because they actually uh, fulfill a general principle with monopolies um, in this case the monopoly is more figurative rather than literal um, which is that people will often find workarounds if something is too expensive within a monopoly and the good example that I can give is 19th century American steel um, it was very much a monopoly um, and what happened was um, the price actually began to suffer because people would try to find the same products or manufacture the same products but using uh, materials that weren't steel so copper, bronze, uh, iron etc um, and the same goes for here if you can't afford expensive plastic modeling kits um, you can get your own 3d printer or buy from somebody for a much cheaper price uh, a similar product that is of the same quality as a forge world uh, resin product excuse me um, 
Now, uh, we have to be a bit dubious. We have to be a bit dubious and skeptical when we come to 3D printing. Because I think 3D printing isn't the cash cow that people think it is. I think it is limited to only a few number of people. And there are rational and irrational reasons why that's the case. So uh, 3D printers have benefits, but they also have um, shortfalls. Um, and the, the reason particularly is is they're within a specific niche and they don't necessarily apply to everyone um, because people often don't have the facilities or will want to buy uh, a 3D printer in short. Um, the average person who's into GW isn't into wargaming. That, what that particularly means is they're into Games Workshop products specifically, but they're not invested in wargaming or or miniature collecting as a general hobby where they're aware of competitors or other um, companies which do miniature wargaming. Um, maybe down the line they are, but for the most people, for example, who hopped on the bandwagon on COVID, that's not necessarily the case. So to the average person who buys GW products solely and doesn't invest in wargaming in general, uh, it's not something they would probably want to invest long term in. And even then, they might have to balance this prospect with participating in the hobby that GW provides, which includes the experience that we've talked about. Purchasing, cutting off uh, the sprue, glue, painting, and finally uh, gaming, if they do game. Um, so uh, 3D printing for somebody who's very well informed in what the activity offers might know that it's... Uh, uh, cost to benefit analysis is actually relatively narrow so in the long term it provides a benefit but to the person who just wants to glue and paint models that's not necessarily the case uh, 3D printing likely is cheaper in the long run um, so buying a £300 um, 3D printer is and like coinciding with the resin and manufacturing the models themselves that is generating them made out of resin um that is if you can actually have the space and facilities to accommodate that um, is going to be worth it because the average games workshop uh, army in 40k might amount for example to 500 pounds uh, once you've got everything uh, assembled and prepared um so in, in that sense, 3D printing is cheaper in the long run, but it's important to remember that apart from those rational reasons, there's also non-rational reasons because humans are partly non-rational agents. And there's a variety of reasons, both rational and irrational, why investing in a 3D printer isn't the go-to choice. Um, so examples that have been previously mentioned are the whole process that GW provides, uh, the fact that because they've merged their IP with the hobby itself, uh, they provide an experience that's not prevalent elsewhere and that is justified with a range of multimedia or diversified products that uh, GW has invested in. So that would be video games, um, uh, uh, Warhammer Plus, despite the fact that the success of it is dubious at best, fan animations, um, fan art whatever um movies you know the the agreement with henry cavill heading the amazon deal um these are all uh, different diversified portfolios that gw is investing in themselves or are outsourcing um and and this is not the case either with the ip and wargaming or the diversified portfolio that bolt action for example and Kings of War, who are both quite um, hefty wargaming companies, um, they don't have this. Um, and it also is partly social, so not being part of the wargaming hobby, um, because going to a games workshop means you are part of a community, even though the staff there might interpret you as a time vampire because you're not there to make money but you are there to see other people who are also taking part in the hobby and that includes um cutting off of sprues painting uh modeling and doing it with other people and you might only see those people when they are in games workshop 
Um, and that's also coincides with immediate and long-term considerations that hinder buying a 3D printer, especially because um, the people tend to focus more on short-term goals than uh, delaying gratification for long-term benefits. So having to spend £300 now seems a lot more than having to spend £30 on a box of 10 Guardsmen each month. Um, and that uh, kind of coincides with that point because um, especially if you're not earning a lot of money per month the I, the prospect of having to give up £300 all at once is going to be quite hefty especially if you don't have long term savings rather than um, having enough when your monthly pay comes in or weekly or hourly pay to uh, buy a box of miniatures uh, each month it just seems like you're making a lot more of saving each time and you might actually see yourself as being more responsible even though the long-term uh, benefit and cost benefit analysis uh, would suggest more evidence that you should buy a 3d printer and use the resin to manufacture your own miniatures um and this is also coinciding with financial obligations and different financial reasons. So that can be mortgages, uh, having to borrow money, family, um, other hobbies, because people do uh, often have multiple hobbies, um, you know, whether that's martial arts, whether that's climbing, surfing, um, wrestling, BJJ, MMA, whatever you want to call it. And that also um, shows what people are incentivized to spend their money more on. Um, so, you know, there are people who can be quite frugal and quite conservative with their finances. And there can be other people who are quite impulsive with their finances. But also simply uh, some people make those decisions on the fly, what they want to do. And there are some people who need to balance it out with other prospects and factors that they that need to be taken into account. And that, that can go to things like travel, uh, gas money uh, for going to work, um, whether or not you're going to eat out or buy food and uh, batch cook for the week. All these things need to be taken into consideration. So, without these, with these factors in mind, um, it, it's very difficult to ascertain whether or not um, the statement that GW's growth isn't sustainable is true. What I mean is, it, it makes a lot of sense to say Games Workshop business practices aren't sustainable in the long run. However, there isn't any, a lot of people say this and it's problematic because there isn't really a lot of evidence to suggest that the business practice isn't sustainable. In fact, actually the evidence, contrary to popular belief, um, shows that the business practice is actually more than sustainable. Um, so unless there's evidence to suggest that it's having an effect on the amount of money GW makes, the price is very much sustainable in the long run. And I think it comes to a key point just that is just because we think it isn't uh, because it seems unfair or doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's true. Uh, it's often the case that processes will go on until they simply stop working, regardless of how unviable or unfair we consider them. Um, and, uh, you know, a good example is the Roman Empire in the West, uh, despite kind of levels of corruption and unethical behavior went on for like what 600 years and then in the east it went on for a thousand more years despite its inefficiencies and uh, you know you can make this argument with the current uh, global system which is very much a product of pax americana uh, because the um global financial system is linked to the united states prominence after the second world war it is based on the u.s essentially holding the global uh, gold supply and then um, when france claimed it back it turned very much to a fiat uh, based system whereby it was based on printing more money um, so the debt ceiling can seem over more infinite america's in a lot of debt 
to China, for example, but nobody's going to claim that debt and it has the largest military anyway, so good luck trying to do that. Um, but for all we know, despite how much we perceive the American or global financial system, which is linked to the American financial system being uh, ineffective, um, that system can go on for um, hundreds and hundreds of years with little to no difference. We might see the world today, apart from minor changes over the years, for example, the uh, splitting of the Sudan from North to South Sudan, as being more or less very similar to what it is now, to what it is in 500 years time. Um, and uh, in the similar way, the Roman M the Roman system uh, lasted, what, 2,000 years? This could last 10,000 years. So um, systems can often be in place um, for as long as they can be until they stop working. Uh, or the processes surrounding them or the impetuses to do so stop working regardless of how many people say that uh, the empire is in decline or is failing and it might not be objectively speaking um, just because we think that um, things are uh, not fair or doesn't make sense um, because it seems like they're unfair or doesn't make sense doesn't necessarily mean it's true um, and this is especially when reality provides firm options rather than ideals. And I'll quote Thomas Sowell here by saying, Life does not give us what we want, it simply provides us with options. Now, if you're born in a um, lower economic threshold than your neighbours, or the, uh, compared to the rest of the block that you're living on, or you live in the projects or something... The fact that your family or your neighborhood has significantly less money means that you have fewer options available to utilize compared to maybe an upper middle class neighborhood where that's available. Now, you can look at that and you can say that I wish I had more stuff. I wish I had better health care. I wish I was in a position whereby I could sustain better money or make better money and there's certain psychological factors as a result of that for example if you're trying to survive paycheck to paycheck you often think um, short term so you often are in a position where you don't really think about the long term and because th things are so short you often go for a lot of instant gratification to mediate the amount of suffering you have compared to um, somebody who has the finances where they can actually think ahead and have the leisure to think ahead as well. And this is the reason why things like, for example, in lower class neighborhoods, um, things like alcoholism or drug use um, is often more prevalent. And it's simply because life is often harder. Um, and it also means that to persevere in such environments, you need to have a very good work ethic and you need to be able to manage your affairs accordingly and you need to be part of a social network or community which can do that uh, a lot more effectively. Now, if you're in an upper class uh, neighborhood, it often means that you have more money and more leisure time to focus now uh, and and show um and have more opportunities and you can pick and choose which opportunities are going to benefit you the most now in reference to that that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make smarter choices as a result there are a lot of stupid rich people who grow up because their father or their mother or mainly their father usually made a lot of money and they are the sons or daughters of that person and they inherit that wealth they're not as smart because they don't pick up that smart from their parents the only way they could do that is if they're on the job with their father usually a lot of the time um which is what you see for example with uh the branson family in virgin um and you see that with a lot of corporations where um the founder has a majority uh, shareholder in the company um, what that basically means is um, they are often taught through the rigorous rigmarole of having to rule a corporation and often the process of going into that. 
but a lot but some families you don't often make the mistake of living letting their children live through luxury and as a result they're completely dis disconnected with reality entirely on this at the same time you have uh, people on the lower rungs of society economically who are who often because there's more of an incentive to not delay gratification will often spend the money unwarrantedly uh, but at the same time there are some who due to adversity will become better people by organizing their finances regardless of how small and timid they are um more economically effectively and essentially through self-sacrifice and through organizing the family unit um, which is the most low and common denominator of a unit of people effectively they can essentially go up the rungs and we see this with middlemen communities in history so the chinese in malaysia uh, the jewish community um, historically has had this reputation because they have often had the middleman existence and are therefore more likely to be discriminated against because of that uh, the Igbos in uh, west africa the lebanese in west africa as well all these communities have um oh koreans in uh uh predominantly black hoods or ghettos all these communities um are often despised by the people around them um uh, and also um are often middlemen communities which is why they're uh, often despised as well and the reason is is because these communities um are able to provide services that the majority of the people don't really rationalize where they get their services from and also because they're not working with their hands on a daily basis and they're exchanging money these people can often be seen as very dirty um, or very backdoor dealing and for example this was the case with the jewish communities uh, throughout european history um, they don't see they're not seen as contributing anything to society and we actually have an experiment in a um a, a prison for allied soldiers whereby you had middlemen who would um supply goods like cigarettes and soap in these prisons uh to the um people who were imprisoned so they're they're co-prisoners and what actually happened is these people actually ended up being hated as a result um even though they were supplying this and you actually see this um in communities where communities that have been kicked out such as jewish communities in various parts of europe um the economic status of that area decreases massively simply because the services that were initially provided are no longer provided there so you know these people kind of wave their fists and say um these communities are doing backdoor dealings and dirty and they shouldn't be here but the moment that they leave the community starts to suffer because uh, they're simply not getting the goods and services they originally got and you can that that isn't only uh, a european thing or a jewish thing that can be applied to for example like i said the chinese in malaysia the Le lebanese in west africa uh, the ebos in nigeria all these examples get conjured up um i don't know where i was really going with this but um where was i going with this um i i think the point that i'm trying to make is that um even in situations where there is different economic um starting points in situations where people have the amount uh, the optimum amount of freedom to pursue whatever opportunities they want where they are not hamstrung or discriminated against or um and when i say discriminated that can be um done purposefully but it can also be via circumstance as well um the opportunity the 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 situations where the opportunities are equally available not the outcomes um, just the opportunities are um provide a situation where people can provide the basis point on wanting to proceed further and what i mean by that is there are simply more people given the opportunity so in situations where people want to excel or have the drive to do so they will be able to um 
So what I'm trying to say is even in economic situations where people are very well off or are suffering or on the very low wrong sectors of society, it, it's actually uh, two points, which I always caveat. One, it's complicated. And two, it depends. And those points either come one or the other, one after the other, and also are interchangeable as well. And they're not mutually exclusive either. Um, but I, I'm saying this because it, it's kind of a, th a, th uh, a way of consoling people to say that it's not necessarily the end of the world, uh, but at the same time, on a basis of life itself, life can be incredibly unfair. Um, people often don't get what they want. People often say, I wish this was more fair or this was more affordable. And then when it, the government, for example, makes it artificially more affordable, it creates more problems in the long run. The economy is a lot like an organism where messing with one part can often lead to detrimental effects in other places that aren't related. Um, for example, homelessness with rent control or affordable housing. Um, and for example, the way that institutions, whether public or private, are incentivized based on um, where the money's coming from. So, for example, nonprofits um, tend to be incentivized to spend as much money as possible before the next assessment of trying to find out how much money that certain sector within the charity or nonprofit needs because. If there is a surplus at the end, it means that they don't need any further funding. So the only way to justify more funding is to um, spend as much money as possible. So you'll have charities who um, have like £10,000 surplus and they'll spend it on laptops or office facilities or something really stupid so that they can get rid of the money. Uh, because they're non-profit, so they don't make money from selling to people and their survivability isn't dependent on um, them turning a profit, which is the ultimate liability for any company, which makes them the most public because it's the B, it's the difference between um, going under and also uh, surviving at the same time. Whereas something that's not profit driven isn't bound by the same incentives in the same way. Um, it's bound to be the most effective based on uh, what its product is designed for, who it is selling to, and who buys the products ultimately. Um, and this is also something, for example, in the US military or any military, any military department worth their salt who wants more money in the end will want to spend their money and go into a deficit because then they can justify why they should receive more money as a result and this is this is what i'm trying to say is these shortfalls happen whether or not you're public or private but they also more importantly show that human behavior is universal uh, in certain themes uh, regardless of what the organization is and also that there are pros and cons and shortfalls uh, within every system regardless of uh, public or private it depends on what you want those trade-offs to be or what you want those pros cons and shortfalls to be as thomas so would say um you know things aren't right and wrong there are just trade-offs to everything um so the i guess the base thing of what i'm saying is if gw keeps selling and it sees no reason to alter itself in any way um, it will keep continuing the way it's continuing because it's not incentivized to do otherwise. If people are still buying the products, regardless of the rhetoric that's spoken in line with whether or not people see it as justifiable or not justifiable, there can be 10 loud people saying that they don't agree with GW's prices and then there can be a 1,000 people not saying anything who are buying GW products regardless. So that brings into perspective that just because a lot of people say something doesn't necessarily mean it reflects reality. Action indeed does speak louder than words. Um, that's all I really have to say to that. I hope this has been somewhat educational and I hope this kind of brings perspective into sustainability of a games workshop and why it acts the way it does. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you very much.